Now it's my pleasure to introduce Dennis Wall, Dr. Dennis Wall. <laughs> Dennis is director of the Computational Biology Initiative at Harvard Medical School. His lab has effectively used social networking, especially Facebook, to identify thousands of families for his research. This research has potentially yielded a much shorter behavioral diagnostic tool for autism. We know some of you have already heard about this, but we're excited about his progress and the result. As the consortium is embracing its own social media strategy for our digital work, we've taken some lessons from Dennis, and we thought you would like to learn from him too. Please join me in a warm welcome for Dr. Dennis Wall. Thanks. Thank you, Didi. It's a real honor to be here today. Um, I know I stand between you and lunch, so I'm going to do my best to uh, go quickly. Starting off poorly with that, though. Hold on. Good? Okay. All right, so. Uh, today I'm going to try to talk to you about uh, some, some work that my lab's been engaged in to attempt to abbreviate the behavioral diagnosis of autism through the use of artificial intelligence, specifically machine learning, and, and through the design of mobile health technologies that might penetrate into clinical environments for augmentation and a variety of other opportunities therein. To get started, I just wanted to remind people that, of which they probably already know very well, Autism has a, um, I should wear my glasses, a high incidence rate <clears throat> defined by impairments in three core domains, social interaction, language, and restricted range of interest. It has a strong genetic bias, a strong male bias, and right now it's primarily diagnosed through behavior. And it's in this last point that I want to be focusing on for part of, or for really the entirety of my talk. I should, I should also say that I'm a computational biologist. I've worked primarily in the genetic analysis of autism, but I've started to dive into the behavioral analysis of autism because I see opportunities to apply methodologies and lines of thinking that we've been using for genetic dissection in the area of behavioral analysis, potentially adopting similar methodologies for genetic parsing, of the, the, the parsing of the genetic complexity of autism and, and parsing the behavioral complexity of autism as well. Two of the, the primary tools and instruments that are utilized for the behavioral diagnosis of autism today include the Autism Diagnostic Interview Revised, designed by Catherine Lord and colleagues in 1994. This exam is semi-structured. Weird. Um, something happening to my bullet up there. Investigate, this is my computer too, I don't exactly know what happened. <laughs> Anyways, the, the point of this slide really is I wanted to stress I'm sure many of you are aware of the ADIR. I wanted to stress the fact that it contains 93 questions, 153 items, and it takes around 2.5 to 3 hours to administer. It's quite a long, a long exam, but nevertheless useful. The second behavioral diagnostic exam is the Autism Diagnostic Observation Schedule. This is also designed by Catherine Lord, Lord and uh, colleagues in 2000. This is a very commonly utilized uh, observation-based examination for the, the screening, categorization, and diagnosis of autism. It takes between 30 and 60 minutes to, to uh, conduct the exam. It's followed by some, some time uh, frame for, for scoring. The scoring, the questions in, in the exam total 29. The scoring can, between, uh, can be between 12 and 14. And, and that may bring the time between, uh, the, the total time to administer this examination up to, uh, up to 60 to 90 minutes in length. So these have been tremendously widely adopted and utilized uh, across the country and across the world for, for autism diagnosis or preliminary screening of autism and ultimately diagnosis of autism. But there are serious delays in diagnosis nevertheless. Across the United States, the average age of initial diagnosis is approximately 5.7 years. 27% of individuals, it's estimated 27% of individuals remain undiagnosed at, at eight years old. And the average age from initial indication to clinical diagnosis is approximately 13 months. Obviously, as already uh, mentioned previously in some of the talks this morning, diagnosis capabilities in areas that are outside of metropolitan areas like Boston and other places are, 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 are extremely limited. And these limitations in access to clinical care facilities for diagnosis further increase the delays in, in, in diagnosis for children and further prevent the opportunity for children to receive early interventional therapy that will have 
greater impacts that will be administered during developmental time windows that have the maximum likelihood of changing, altering the course of the development for that particular child. So we're in a situation where we do need to have new approaches for early detection so that we can enable delivery of earlier care, earlier and much more often in a more widespread capacity. So that's where I'm hoping to, to come in and make a limited impact. Just to stress the point a little bit further, in this slide, although you may not be able to see it very well, I've, I've ticked off a few purple places where there are clinical care facilities in Massachusetts. You'll notice that this opacity of, of uh, care facilities outside of the metropolitan area of Boston, but of course with the can-do efforts that are going on at UMass, I'm sure that'll change in the near future. We map on top of that the occurrence rate of autism in, is that up there? In, uh, in, in Massachusetts, we see clearly that there's, a, there's an issue associated with distance between kids that have, or potentially kids that have autism and the clinical care facilities that can diagnose them. And when you scale this up to a larger level across the United States, you can imagine the situation gets, gets incredibly worse, substantially more severe, until you get to the West Coast, potentially, until you get to California, for example. So we're in a situation where we have a, a, a great problem and barrier for uh, availability to act, uh, for resources. The resources to diagnose children are quite lengthy. And so what are we going to do about that? <clears throat> and that's where hopefully we can step in and, and start to look at the potential of data mining. Now this is where I can, this is my cup of tea. I, I understand how to data mine. And it turns out there's some data sets out there that I can take advantage of. There are large repositories of data from Agree, the Simon Simplex collection, and, and from right here in, in Boston, the Boston Autism Consortium's collection of data. These data sets are, are large enough that they allow substantial and sophisticated retrospective analyses that uh, include things like artificial intelligence and machine learning that enable us to, to understand the data sets with respect to redundancies and correlations across questions or across instruments so we can start to look for opportunities to reduce without loss of accuracy so that we can conduct examinations faster and more effectively and earlier. So a big question that I want to try to address in this talk is can the instruments that we, uh, that, that we, that we utilize commonly, like ADOS and ADIR, be altered in some way or be understood in a, in a different way to maximize efficiency of diagnosis without any loss of accuracy in the diagnosis, uh, diagnostic outcome? Many of you may already have Siri in your pocket right now. This is a, a system that we utilize, or will soon be utilizing daily to understand where the nearest restaurants are and so on. This, this system is entirely based in, in the, the art and practice of machine learning. I, brought, I put it up there so I could try to put this within some context. Machine learning actually isn't all that complicated when you bring it down to its simplistic elements. It takes no, known data to build a prediction. It can be refined through training and testing procedures iteratively. And then it ultimately is applied to unseen data to bear out those predictions and validate the predictions that the, the classifier, which is the prediction engine built by the machine learning algorithms, uh, has, has made. <clears throat> so these are, uh, machine learning has penetrated in many fields, not just voice recognition, but it enables us to predict whether a patient hospitalized due to a heart attack will have a second heart attack, and enables us to predict the price of a stock in six months, and enables us to identify the risk factors for prostate cancer, for example. And so these are common applications of machine learning. The question now is can we apply machine learning technologies to these data sets that exist that, uh, that contain upwards of 2,000 individuals who have already been diagnosed with autism. And so we've started to examine them, particularly the AGREE, the Simon Simplex, and the Autism Consortium data sets. We obviously need to start with one data set as our baseline to construct a classifier. In this case, we utilize the Autism Genetic Research Exchange, which contains 891 individuals diagnosed with autism and 75 individuals who did not meet the criteria for an autism diagnosis or considered non-spectrum. And then we utilize the remaining data sets that we have available to us for validation of this, of this classifier, of this prediction tool. So when we do this, we take our data sets. In this case, we're looking at the score sheets from the 800, sorry, from the 891 uh, autism individuals who are diagnosed with autism and the 75 individuals who were found to have, an, uh, who were found to be outside of the spectrum. And we, we take a, a portion of the data set, in this case, approximately a third of the data set for training of the classifier, and then we utilize the remainder for testing the classifier. So it's all done with, within this one data set. We're going through it iteratively woo, to, uh, to, pu to pull together a classifier. We do this 10 times, which is the recommended dosage you know, within the, within the field of machine learning, and I validated that with my MIT colleagues to make sure I wasn't doing anything stupid. And we, we wind up with a machine learning classification system that enables us to distinguish between individuals who 
would be diagnosed with autism from individuals who would, be diag who would not be diagnosed with autism, who would, be, who would fall outside of the, sp of the spectrum. The objective, of course, is to maximize sensitivity and specificity, in this case, our ability to accurately detect individuals with autism and to accurately detect individuals who do not have autism. <clears throat> so let's take a look at that. Oh, by the way, this is a, a, the data set that we're using is the ADAR data. This is the 93 questions, 153 elements across the 891 individuals with autism and 75 without. So it's a very large data set when you, when you think about it in those terms. And the question is how well can we do in terms of accuracy, in terms of sensitivity and specificity? When we plot sensitivity versus uh, specificity, we can see we can do pretty darn well. We end up with, an, with a, a classifier built by a machine learning tool called the Alternating Decision Tree that has 99.9% .9 accuracy. In other words, it misdiagnosed no individuals who had previously been diagnosed, diagnosed with autism, and it, misdiag it misdiagnosed only a fraction of individuals who were identified as off the spectrum. <clears throat> so it has an incredibly promising accuracy, very perfect sensitivity, and near-perfect uh, specificity. This is what it looks like. I mean, you could say, okay, gee whiz, so what? M maybe, maybe it's not that much smaller in terms of its content than in the original exam, the original ADIR. But in fact, when you look at the decision tree, which is what the alternating decision tree tool builds, the tree itself is extremely small. It contains only a fraction of elements. And the, the way to look at this tree is to think of it as a as a, as a path through which you increment a running sum statistic up or down depending on the answers to the questions represented at the nodes of the tree. And these are the nodes that are in green, well, green letters anyways. And at the end of the day, you wind up with a positive score or a negative score. If you're positive, you would be diagnosed with autism. If you're negative, you'd be diagnosed with a non, as non-spectrum. The uh, the magnitude of the score is an indication of the confidence that one should have in the classification, which ends up being quite valuable to be able to assess the confidence one should have in, in, in the outcome when conducting classification using this, this particular tool. So let's cut, cut it down to the brass tacks. When we, we look at it, this decision tree really only represents seven questions in total. Seven questions out of the total of 93, a dramatic reduction of 93% of the total exam, the ADIR. And what this would effectively translate into is a reduction in exam time from approximately 2.5 hours to less than five minutes. These are the seven questions that are represented in the classifier. And as I mentioned, this classifier has extremely high accuracy with 99.9%. Now, I also mentioned that this was conducted, this procedure of machine learning was conducted within a single data set, the agreed data set. We have to be able to go beyond that and look at unseen data to determine and validate the efficacy of the seven question system. So we did that with the Simon Simplex collection and with the AC. And we see, again, an astounding rate of validation. In this case, 100% of the individuals recognized as having autism within the Simon Simplex collection were predicted by the seven question classifier accurately. 321 of the 322 within the Autism Consortium data set, a 99.7% accuracy were predicted. And because of the paucity of, of individuals that were non-spectrum within the data sets, we elected to group all of our individuals non-spectrum to come up with a total score, a 92% accurate, uh, sorry, 92% accuracy, which represents 92% specificity, really, of, of, of diagnosis capabilities for this particular seven-question classifier. But, but the bottom line is 99.9% effective in AGREE, 100% effective for autism diagnosis in S Simon Simplex collection, 99.7 in AC, and 92% effective for diagnosing individuals off the spectrum and not getting someone misdiagnosed who shouldn't be diagnosed with autism. So for us, it's, it's quite exciting. <clears throat> so let's see how well it does across uh, uh, ages. Right now, uh, you'll notice that the, well, if you were paying attention to the previous slides, that the ages of, let's say, the Simon Simplex are four and above, so we want to be able to make an early intervention system. We want to be able to do something for younger kids. It turns out we do have some data represented in these data sets that can give us some indication early on of the uh, accuracy within younger ages. So along the x-axis, we have age. Along the y-axis, it's the AD tree score. On, this, uh, down, uh, on, the, on the bottom part of this y-axis is classification of autism. Above that is classification of non-spectrum. You'll see a few red dots that represent the misclassifications that brought the specificity down to 92%. It turns out there are only seven of them, all seven, 
um, had previous, had already met previous criteria for an autism diagnosis via ADOS. So there's some conflict between ADAR outcome and ADOS outcome. Five of them had a previous diagnosis coming into the studies. And so all of them appear to be somewhat suspect and, and may represent individuals to be worthy of further investigation before we conclude that the classifier was wrong or that their original diagnosis was wrong. But the age range is, is incredibly impressive, all the way from 13 months to approximately 49 years in terms of accuracy of classification of individuals with autism. So we felt good about that particular uh, result because it showed us that we were able to validate, we were able to take our classifier and apply it to unseen data and come up with an accuracy that was high. <clears throat> we also wanted to see if we could do it for, for, for other kinds of data, for data that would be provided to us through the community. And so we decided to harness the power of the social network and jump out into the world of Facebook. And, and using SurveyMonkey, we, we've, we created a survey that included, that encapsulated the large, that encapsulated the seven question classifier and, and required additional information to enable us to validate uh, from the community, the community of individuals who have a child or an, who have a person in their family with autism, providing us with answers through this particular Facebook enabled survey system. We did a lot of marketing campaigns to make sure it worked out well, and this is just to show you how great the Facebook marketing capability, how impressive Facebook marketing actually can be. There's a dramatic spike in activity. Our, our actual web traffic increased, you can't really tell, this is not a very good diagram, but increased by 500%. During the time of the campaign, you'll see this large spike in activity over here. Anyways, it worked. We got a lot of participants. We got over 2,000 participants in less than three months, actually. All the participants are taking the survey, telling us the answer is really the, diagnost the diagnostic outcome for their child or for the person for which they provide care, and also telling us a diagnosis. So when we do that and we look at this self-reporting information, we find that we still have an incredibly high rate of accuracy in distinguishing autism from non-spectrum at 97.8%. We also can start to look at granularities within the autism spectrum itself. 96% for Asperger, 92% for PDD-NOS, 98% for classic autism. Then we can also see a little bit more granularity with non-spectrum conditions, including other learning disabilities, although we have a lot more work to do in that area to be able to confirm that this classifier will work for individuals who have learning disabilities that are not related to autism. Nevertheless, so far it's looking very good and very promising, and this approach of utilizing Facebook and harnessing the power of social networks turns out to be an incredibly powerful one, assuming you buy the self-reporting information, which right now we do. So, <clears throat> moving into ADOS, I, I, so all of that was just to tell you about the seven question classifier for ADR. We've also applied very similar, in fact, identical methodologies for the analysis of ADOS in, in, an, in an effort that's related to the ones that I just described previously. ADOS module one is the one that's most commonly employed for, uh, deployed for younger children. We wanted to evaluate that one again because we're looking for early, early intervention, early detection tool to, for the development of an early intervention, early detection tool. This examination, as I mentioned previously, contains 29 items associated with 10 activities. It is conducted within a clinical environment. Again, we went through the data collection for training, testing, and construction of a classifier that I mentioned previously. We used AGREE again in this case for the classifier construction, and the Simon Simplex and Autism Consortium for the validation steps of, of the classification uh, of, the, uh, of the machine learning uh, approaches in, in general. So I just threw this back up there just to remind you. I probably went through this too quickly, but we were pretty confident that we did this right. Again, we're using a portion of the data for uh, training the classifier, a portion for testing the classifier. We do this using tenfold cross-validation to ensure that we maximize sensitivity specificity without overfitting. And we're doing this, I forgot to mention, I think in the previous slide, for not just one machine learning approach, but for 16 different ones that are commonly deployed within the machine learning field. So we're looking at the, we're looking at the competition of results provided by 16 different machine learning algorithms to find the one that's the best, the one that has the smallest number of questions with the highest accuracy, highest uh, sensitivity and specificity. In this case, we did better than we did with ADIR. We wound up with an alternating, again, the AD tree uh, algorithm performed the best. In this case, it had 100% accuracy, perfect specificity, perfect sensitivity. In some cases, almost too good to be true, but we I hopefully will show you in a couple of slides that we, we believe it and we feel like it's fairly effective. This classifier, I won't, I won't bore you with another tree, the decision tree, because it's not all that useful, contains only eight, eight questions. It's 72% shorter than the full ADOS. 
One item focuses on language and communication, five on social interactions, two on how the child plays with objects. <clears throat> when we've, we look at the validation and coverage in terms of age, we see a widespread coverage of ages with accuracy, as I mentioned, at 100, nearly 100%. We did have, when we looked at additional data sets in the validation steps, two misdiagnoses only, so dropping our, our ability, our specificity down somewhat, but not, not too badly. And these two are misclassifications are, are both small scores. I mentioned the 83 score is a confidence score that provides you with some measure of confidence that you should have in the classification in the first place. So we would have questioned these to begin with. But it also turns out that they were classified in the opposite direction by the competing diagnostic instrument, ADOS. And so they're providing you with some indication that these individuals should be re-examined potentially. <laughs> All right, so with ADIR, it's straightforward. We can take an, a 93 question examination and we can reduce it to seven questions with th virtually no loss in accuracy. With ADOS as an observation-based uh, di a diagnostic instrument, it's somewhat more challenging to imagine how one reduces the time with just an eight question classifier because you still have to observe the child. So these are the eight questions that are winnowed out when we look at our classification system. One thing that we can identify right out of the gates is that we can reduce the total number of activities be based on the, the individual questions that are represented within our classifier that again had nearly 100% accuracy. We can, th th this classification system also enables a, us to look for potentials to reorder the activities, thereby increasing the efficiency, maximizing the likelihood of arriving at a diagnosis earlier within an examination rather than later. And, and finally, and I think most importantly, these questions provide us with some simple parameters that we may be able to utilize within alternative approaching, uh, with, uh, within alternative observational media such as videos to be able to diagnose autism not within a clinical setting but outside of a clinical setting or at least screen autism outside of a clinical setting prior to a clinical visit. <clears throat> so we've launched a, a video project to test that fact directly. This video project is live now uh, through our website that I should have put on here. However, we have a poster you can go and check out which will give you the website. This, this uh, video project really represents, at this point, a, a proof of concept. We're taking data, in this case, from YouTube. There's a bunch of YouTube videos that we were able to get our hands on that contain individuals in natural home environment settings taken on ha handheld recording devices that have autism. These are videos that are of variable quality between two and five minutes in length, and we've used eight analysts in my lab to score these videos using our modified ADIR and modified ADOS. These collected together represent essentially 15 questions that need to be answered when analyzing a two to five minute uh, video. They can be answered within the time frame of the video itself, and we can do an inter-rater reliability assessment across the eight analysts that were trained and deployed for uh, these, the, this proof of concept phase within my lab. <clears throat> The inter-rater reliability was incredibly high. You'll see this on the poster that's represented upstairs uh, if you get a chance to go later. The inter-rater reliability with, with regards to, especially with regards to diagnosing with autism versus non-spectrum was incredibly high. I see the bar charts here represent the preponderance of answers, uh, the preponderance of the kind of answer to specific questions within the ADOS. These are the questions, A2, B1, and so on. These are the eight questions, and these are the answers. And you'll see that in all cases, virtually all cases, there's a big difference in the big bars between the autism group and the non-spectrum group, indicating that there's good interrelator reliability. When we look at this in a combined fashion, we can see that we have incredibly high accuracy with respect to diagnosis with autism versus diagnosis without autism, based again on these two to five minute video clips using a very short version of the ADOS and the ADIR for analysis misclassification of only five and accuracy of 95%. We've done a lot of community building with this effort. We've reached out to the community. We've built an, an Outworks YouTube channel which has been asking the community of individuals who already have a child with autism to provide us with a video so that we can continually refine these practices, come up with better and better methodologies that ultimately will be either partially or fully automated at some level. <clears throat> Where is this going? It's not meant to be 
a, not meant to be a replacement for clinical practices by any stretch of the imagination. We only imagine this as a clinical assistance procedure through which a clinician can add a patient to an online system. And a care provider can go to that system and provide simple patient information and upload a, upload a video, importantly, and enabling us, our analysts, to score the videos so that we can provide a preliminary risk assessment and spit that risk assessment back to the clinician and provide a risk, risk profile back to the community person at risk looking for answers in a remote rural area about whether or not their child has autism. <clears throat> the caregiver can call into a clinic to make the appointment. A clinician can create the patient online, prof uh, online profile. The system will send an email notification and instructions to the care provider. Care provider enters that information in a very simplistic way, uploads a video. We analyze, as I mentioned previously, again, this, a lot of this is based on our, our preliminary work on modifications of the ADAR and the ADOS. But we've also engineered a series of other steps into this clinical assistance tool that will ensure interrelator reliability and efficacy of the outcomes. The outcome, um, this is just a quick slide on how we do the scoring. The video is, 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 is placed literally on top of a web system of the questions that need to be answered for the video. They're matched up with aspects of the video appropriately, so you can always be answering the right questions at the right time based on elements of the video itself. And the outcome is, a, is, a, is, a, is essentially a risk assessment report that goes back to the clinic or goes back in some capacity to the, to the caregiver so that they can understand more about what their child is doing. And the clinic can also understand what they might be looking for when that child comes in for a true clinical visit, a, a true diagnostic assessment. <laughs> This is just one example where we have a high-risk individual where the recommendation is for immediate action, that the patient is exhibiting clear signs of classic autism, and the, this is underlying supporting information that supports that recommendation. This is a case where an individual is not at immediate risk. And this is a, a report that we give back to a care provider, providing a simple assessment of their child and then recommendations to the nearest clinical facilities that they can contact to go forward with a clinical assessment and clinical diagnosis. So the benefits and potentials of a lot of what I've just been talking about I think are pretty, are pretty real. With respect to the videos, we have a child engaging in a natural environment. Through a system like this, we can enable a dialogue with the clinicians that includes continual monitoring through home video uploads, for example. This will speed information transfer to clinics without a doubt. And it will give us, if we can go forward with this in the right way, a repository of videos that will enable new insights and enable standardization of how we look at various aspects of autism and potentially how we do diagnosis. It also, of course, provides remote access. It's very unrestricted. All you need is an internet cable, internet uh, connection. And it, so it's remote. It reaches the remote, remote portions of the, of, of the United States and, and will potentially reach the remote portions of the world. The barrier to entry for care providers is extremely low, and as I mentioned already, our approach is looking to be quite fast, highly accurate, and scalable to allow for growth as we go forward. So are we gonna get to the point where we have a Siri for autism screening? I, I, don't, I don't know, and that may not necessarily be what, what I'm aiming at here, but it's, it's uh, tantalizing to think of a system, handheld devices, and so on like that, and how we might be able to harness handheld devices and efforts like the one I just described to hasten the process of diagnosis appropriately so that it reaches a larger number of children within a, a developmental time window that actually matters for the, for the kid. So acknowledgments, lots of people helped provide sanity checks that my computational brain wasn't going off in the wrong direction. And with that, I'll end and take questions.